to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are you gone? Yeah, I see. 
praise Him. Praise Him. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them.
grander earth has quaked before. Moved by the sound of his voice, and seas that are was shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well. Far be it from me to not be me, even when my eyes can't see this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all.
to die for our sins and be raised again, feeding Satan, sin, and death so that we might have a restored relationship with you. It is only because of your power that we can stand. It's only because of your power that we have any hope. And Lord, we do have hope. A hope that will not fail, a hope that will not fade. We will be with you one day. You will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more pain. No more suffering. We will be with you. In your loving arms. May Father, I lift up any who are here. Who have not yet put their trust in you. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would draw them to yourself. They might acknowledge their need for a Savior, that they are a sinner in need of a Savior. Turn from that sin to follow Jesus Christ. Make Him Lord of their life. So that they might have the hope that we have. You are out there wondering if this is the day to put your trust in Jesus. We know that it is. There's no guarantees of how many days we have or how many moments we have. Now is that time. Heavenly Father, I just lift up Pastor Chris. I just pray that your words be heard. He would fade away that our hearts and minds be focused on you. Or that our hearts be fertile soil, ready to receive the word you have for us, your word. Or that we might be transformed, that we might be changed, and have a desire to follow you as you've called us to. To each individually come together as the body of your son, Jesus Christ. In order to further your kingdom for your glory by your power. We just praise you, we thank you, Lord, we praise you, pray, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, church, wouldn't it be amazing, wouldn't it be great if we were alive during the events of the book of Acts to see all of the events that were unfolding during this time. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing to see God answering prayer, seeing entire communities changed for Jesus Christ, to see thousands of people coming to know Christ in a single day? Awesome. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, oh, come on. That's got to be more amazing than what you're yeah. saying. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that would be unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, just to think about what God was doing in the early church in single days would be, un I mean, it wouldn't be unbelievable because with God, all things are possible. Amen. You know, but one of the things we have to remember also, too, is that back in the days of the early church, living for Christ was not an easy task. It wasn't simple. Because as I read it stated one way, back then, a Christian was completely fearless, continually cheerful, and constantly in trouble. I mean, think about that. And because the early Christians, they would count the cost and they would be completely and totally sold out for Jesus. Amen. They would. Because you didn't have cultural Christians back then. Because you couldn't accept Jesus Christ and not identify with him. It was too difficult. Because people knew when you gave your life to Jesus, you lived for him. You did. 
That's what you did back in those days. And see, what we saw last week when we dove in to the first part of chapter 19 is we saw this very thing happening right before our eyes. We saw revival happening in the city of Ephesus. We saw lives changing right before people's very eyes. As one pastor equated it, how many of you all have seen, um, as winter fades, you've seen the leaves of a tree that have made it through the winter and have stuck to a branch? Seen that? Okay. They're not green, are they? They're brown, but they've made it through, right? And as they fall to the ground, they cut, they can, they're, they're lightweight, but they get crushed, right, very, very easily. Well, what happens is, is that as a leaf survives the winter, if it stays attached to the branch, the new life that is budding through those branches pushes the old leaf off the branch. And as the seasons of life roll past, as we, as believers, as we shake off the old leaves, sometimes the things of the old life, what do they do? They try to, they try to hold on, don't they? They try to hold on. But just like the budding of new leaves, as the gospel wells up in our lives, as we spend time with Jesus, as we spend time in his word, as we spend time as Proverbs 27, 17 states that, that iron sharpens iron. As we do these things, as it wells up in our lives, just like the people of Ephesus, we see the gospel growing in them. And just like it's supposed to do in us, the old leaves quietly fall away. Right? Okay. And see, this is exactly what happened. This is what happened in Acts 19. The persistent labor of Paul his labor in the gospel. The people of the church were repenting. Revival was happening. They were, I mean, if you go back to 19 verse 18, what were they doing? They were, they were believers, but they didn't realize, oh my gosh, I'm still living in sin. I need to repent of this. And they repented of their old practices. They brought their books of magic and they burned them. They were giving up of their old life. So noticeable that others that didn't know Jesus Christ, what did they do? They came to a saving knowledge of him. They came to an understanding of Jesus. And as we see the story continue to unfold in the latter portion, the last half of verse chapter 19, more and more people repent of their sin. More and more people come to know Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. Shouldn't we be doing the same thing? Shouldn't we be repenting of sin? Shouldn't we be living a lifestyle and sharing Jesus Christ in such a way that more and more people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? So with that thought in mind, I'd like for us to look at the last portion of chapter 19 today. The last 20 verses, and for context, we're going to look at verses 21 through 30 for our reading together today. So if you would, turn to Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 40, and for our reading, we're going to look at 21 through 30. And if you would, stand together in the honor of the reading of God's word, if you are able. It says this, now, after these events... Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Acacia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. 
For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought a little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have made our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, <laughs> this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. Amen. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged, and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Erastachus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for all that you are, Father, all that you provide, Father, for the privilege and the honor that it is to be here today. Father, we thank you for the worship, bringing us before the throne, setting the table for continual worship through the word. Father, I pray that we would sit at your feet. Father, that everything around us, all distractions, anything else, would fade away. And God, that we would focus solely and completely, continue to focus on you. For you and you alone are worthy of our worship. Father, I thank you. I praise you. <clears throat> Lord, may you be glorified as we continue to honor you. Jesus, we love you, for it's in your powerful name that all God's children pray. Amen. Amen. You can be See, there was... Paul had a, a, an evangelism strategy. I mean, that's very obvious. See, we, we know that there was a sense of accomplishment. I mean, there was a well-deserved satisfaction in how God had used Paul to do amazing things. We know that God had used Paul to spread the gospel. I mean, look at where he had been. Thus far. He'd been to Galatia. He'd been to Europe. I mean, he wanted to go to Ephesus, but God had told him no. But now God had allowed him to go. I mean, Ephesus was the, the center point between the east and the west. Okay, the, the link, if you will. And yes, Paul's priority, we understand this. Paul's priority was to evangelize. But he also did not forget about the churches that had been allowed to be planted along the way. And so because of this, he sent Timothy, he sent Erastus to raise funds to help these other churches prepare to be able to do ministry as they had been instructed to do. So there's, there's positives that, that have been happening up until this point. But we also know that in life, and this is not just in the people in the city of Ephesus, but we also know that for us as believers, we also know that if we are striving to live for Jesus, if we are truly living the life, a lifestyle of worship as we discussed today in Sunday school, if we are diving in and allowing the gospel to fill us, if we're allowing the spirit to dwell in us, you're going to see a new budding of life. Those old leaves are going to fall away. And when those old leaves begin to fall away, what should you expect? Well, there's a few things. When the old leaves fall away, just like the people of Ephesus and for us, you're going to experience persecution. You are. 
Okay, if you look at verses 23 through 28 as our focus at this point, when the Lord is being followed, when, when, when we are following his will, it goes against everything that the enemy has planned. It does. Okay? It goes against everything of that nature. And I want us to understand, the enemy is crafty. The enemy is sneaky. But here's the thing. This is not the deceiver enemy that we see in 2 Corinthians. This is the destroyer in 1 Peter 5. I mean, he's fed up with Paul. <laughs> I mean, he truly is. He's fed up with Paul. I mean, if you go back and you look to previous chapters of Acts, remember you had the sons of Sceva that were trying to do things in the name of Jesus. And what happened? <laughs> they were like, Jesus we know Paul, we've heard of. Okay, so Paul's making a name for himself. But what do they say? We don't know you, and they attacked, right? Okay, so the enemy itself is in confusion. The house divided against itself right now. And you have Satan. He's fed up. He's tired of it, right? So if you look at verses 23 through 25, it states that it's about that time. There arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. Listen, we know that the church of Ephesus is growing. It's growing by leaps and bounds, which is in direct contrast to who? The enemy. It's in direct contrast to the occult that we described last week. The occult had already been planted there. It was a center for that. This was an epicenter of business. The epicenter of business was idol worship. And so... You have the Greek goddess Artemis, and by, uh, by Roman mythology, her name was Diana. Okay? And it was centered around a black meteorite that had fallen from the sky, and they shaped it into a woman who symbolized fertility. Okay? That's, that's what it was. And here's something to think about. We can very easily look at this man named Demetrius. We can very easily look at this and go, well, he's the culprit. Actually, he's not. He's not. It's who's using him that's the culprit. All right? Because the enemy is the focus. Satan is the one that's the focus. Because remember, all of his forces are in confusion. He's stirring up. What's going on? His house is divided right now. He's, he's trying to get things under control. And what we need to also understand is the simplicity of Paul's method. Paul didn't stir things up by attacking the people. He didn't stir things up by staging anti-idol rallies. You know what he did? Yeah. He preached the word. Yeah. He preached the gospel. He preached truth. That's what he did. And those that came to know the Lord as a result of God's word, he encouraged them to do the same, to speak truth. And so, because of that, we continue to see, as you look, look on in this passage, verse 26, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, okay, that's big, because Paul's making an impact. He's making an impact for the kingdom. But in almost all of Asia, ooh, 
That's big. This Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. Amen. More as more and more people came to know the Lord, less and less people bought idols. And we see in verse 27 that they claim that their trade is going to be thrown into ruins. That, but that more importantly, that Artemidas' greatness is going to be cast aside. Come on, let's be real. Let's be straight. They're not worried about her. They're worried about the Almighty Dollar. They're worried about their trade. But here's the thing, they can't let people know that, right? They can't let people know that. They can't let people understand that. So Satan is using Demetrius to stir up the people. He's, and he uses the whole idea of, well, our goddess is going to be defamed if we don't do something. You know what we need more of today, church? We need more Pauls. We need more men and women who are willing to stand firm, who are willing to proclaim the gospel by the grace of God, helping to lead people from a lifestyle of idols and sin to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. It's, it's like 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. We need people that are willing to proclaim the truth no matter where, when, <coughs> what, or how. Amen. You agree? Amen. But we see that in spite of this thought, in spite of everything that's going on, again, the persecution keeps growing. Look at verse 28 with me. When they heard this, they were enraged. And they were crying out, Great is Artemidas of the Ephesians. Look, the, there wasn't any trouble riling up the people at this point in time because they were in the middle of a debauchery-filled festival called Artemisia. And the chant began. Multitudes poured in. So much so that they filled an entire amphitheater. You see, Paul and the, the church of Ephesus, they were being assaulted because guess what was happening? Those leaves? Those leaves were falling away. The leaves were falling away from people and new life and repentance was happening all around the city. And these people that were coming to an understanding of Jesus Christ. And Paul and his, and his followers, I mean, they could have attacked idolatry head on. But what we're seeing here is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're seeing. And they were so in love with Jesus Christ. They were so in love with the change in their life and what he was doing for them that it actually, it, it brought on, it, it did, it brought on the persecution. Because here's the thing. When we allow God to use us for his glory, the enemy moves and therefore persecution happens. It does. But here's the beautiful thing. Persecution is only for a season. It doesn't stay. I want to make sure that you understand that. I mean, G. Campbell Morgan, 
said this, the, ter the church persecuted has always been the church pure and therefore the church powerful. The church patronized has always been the church in peril and very often the church paralyzed. Let that sink in for a minute. And one thought is to put it this way, if you put it into a personal perspective, am I doing anything significant enough on behalf of the kingdom of God to stir up the enemy's opposition. We could stop right there and pray. But we're not going to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a heavy thought. I mean, imagine if the church today of today, we're to undergo the same type of repentance and new life that we see happening here. The church overall in our country today. Man, what would happen? We're seeing it. Amen? Amen. I don't want to say that it's not happening because I believe that it is. We're seeing it. I mean, the thing is, is that if we continue to seek after God and follow in his direction and say, God, it's about you and your desire and your will. Let's follow you and not ourselves. And we allow God to move. We're, we're going to see the enemy rise up. Yeah. We're going to see the enemy push back because he doesn't want that. He doesn't want that at all. Because guess what's happening? The leaves are falling away. The leaves are falling away. New life is happening. What? But here's the thing. It's not all bad. I mean, don't get me wrong. Persecution is never fun. But persecution is not bad. It's not bad. But there's also positive things that we see here. When the leaves fall away, we can expect peace and courage. In verses 29 through 31, we see this mob. It's quite a picture. It really is. Look at the first part of 29. So the city was filled with confusion. They rushed together into the theater. And see, this was not the first picture of its sorts. Remember Lystra? Paul was literally stoned almost to death. And as he was revived, what did he do? He walked back into the city. <laughs> Then you look at Philippi. The man had been beat. What's he do? He sings. Okay. How many of you, if you had been stoned almost to death, would get up and walk back into the city that you had just been stoned in? How many of you, if you had just been beaten for the cause of Jesus Christ, would start singing? I mean, I put myself in that category too, so please don't think I'm going, hey, you. I'm saying, me too. I mean, this is, I mean, look at what Paul, the, the example that he's setting for you and I. And now, here he is. He's in Ephesus. He's an immovable rock in a raging sea. Peace in the midst of hateful turmoil. He's like Daniel in the lion's den. Who's scratching the stomachs of the lions until daybreak. Because he knows God is with him. He's like David demanding to know why Goliath is defi defying the armies of the living God. And see, we know that the city was filled with confusion. And in it, they drug two of Paul's companions, Gaius and Articus, into the theater. And see, what Paul wanted to do? How many of you would be like Paul? I gotta go get them. I gotta run in there. I gotta save them. But see, he wanted to go in, he wanted to help them, but in the process of it, he also wanted to preach to them. He wanted to share the gospel to them and to this mob. But people, his, his, his followers said, no, no, 
stay back. And even people that were high-ranking officials that were friends of Paul said, no, no, stay back. And, it came, and Paul had peace about what they were speaking into him. And all of these people that spoke into him, they had peace, they had courage about what was happening. Their consciences were pure, their consciences were clean because they'd done nothing wrong. They had done nothing wrong because when we look at verses 32 through 34, there was even a Jew by the name of Alexander. He tried to quiet things down, but when they found out that he was a Jew, what did they do? They got louder and louder and louder. And the crazy thing was, is most of the mob didn't even know why they were there. They were just going along with it. <laughs> and they cried out for two hours how great Artemis was because they didn't know why they were there. <laughs> and see, with Paul and his companions and those that kept Paul from running in and the high-ranking officials that were friends with Paul, the other believers, they showed that purity was a huge key to power and peace in the midst of spiritual conflict. They knew they'd done nothing wrong. Remember, they hadn't attacked the temple. They had not attacked the idol-worshiping ways. They preached truth. And see, the thing for us is this, that when we break down the walls between ourselves and God, we can rest assured that God is standing with us. See, Paul and his companions, they had peace because there weren't any walls. They hadn't done anything wrong. They trusted God. And here's the beautiful thing. You can too. You can too. It's, it's like Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Exodus 14, 14. One of my favorite verses in scripture. The Lord will fight for you. You have only to be what? Still. How hard is that for us today? Do we even know what the definition of still is? Not very often. See, to rest and trust in God, when we give the Holy Spirit reign in our lives, there's nothing that God can't do through us. Amen. Isaiah 26, 3, he promises us this, God keeps him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he... He trusts in you. Perfect peace. You, do you know what the Hebrew is for perfect peace? Shalom. You ever heard that word before? I hope so. Because if you haven't, you're not paying attention. Shalom. Shalom. When we let the old leaves fall away, when we change from our old lives into the new, when we repent of following the world's agenda, even when we're going through persecution, God gives peace, He gives courage, He gives perfect shalom. He does. And the other thing, he gives, persecution comes, he gives peace and courage, but when the leaves fall away, God assures us of his care. He assures us of his care. It was once written, in its ignorance and blindness is a league of frightened men 
who seek reassurance in collective action. You know what that definition is? A mob. It's a mob. Warren Wiersbe stated it this way. It was a mob that shouted, crucify him. Crucify him. And you know what? They got their way. Imagine what would have happened here if this mob in Ephesus got theirs with Paul. But they didn't. Because God was in control. God was watching out for Paul and his followers the entire time. I mean, look at verses 35 and 36. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. And see, I find it fascinating that this town clerk actually described the character of Christians in the next verse on 37. It's on both sides, it's fine. <laughs> For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. Again, they had done <laughs> nothing wrong. They preached truth. They preached the gospel. They showed God through their action, their word, and their deed. And God did the rest. I mean, God was in control the entire time. All this shouting is going on. And you know what he's doing? He's moving the local officials around like checkers. That's exactly what he's doing. When the mob quieted down, this town clerk spoke up and brought them to their senses. I mean, he used their own laws to quiet them down. And he told them, look, in an orderly way, if you've got a case, bring it correctly. And guess what they didn't have? A case. They didn't have it. They see, what we see here, again, God was in control. We know the way that Paul and his, his followers had been living their life. And you look at Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders. Making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious. Seasoned with salt. So that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Remember, they didn't trash the temple. They didn't attack their idle way of life. They preached the gospel. We have to be winsome to win some. We have to allow the Holy Spirit, church, to work in our lives. We do. And see, as the old leaves fall off, there's assurance that God is in control. As we allow, or as we desire to see God move in our lives, as we desire to see him move in our churches, as we desire to see him move in our communities, guess what we need to be prepared for? Opposition. It's going to happen in the church, it's going to happen outside the church. And let's be honest. If we don't face any opposition, it likely means that we are no threat to the enemy. I mean, really. And if we're not prepared for opposition, more than likely, we're going to probably give up. That's probably what's going to happen. See, Paul, he was prepared for opposition. He faced it by being completely committed to the gospel and the Christ that it proclaimed. He was ready. 
he was ready. And see, as believers, both new and old, we're going to face opposition as we grow in our faith. But here's the wonderful thing. It's for a season. And something else to keep in mind. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. Amen. Would you bow with me? Remember, church, that as God moves in our lives, as we allow him to move and work in our hearts, that yes, we're going to face persecution. But remember that also there's peace, there's courage, and there's care. Because God never leaves us nor forsakes us. That's truth, church. And see, what we see is God continually working in the midst of the enemy in chapter 19, all throughout it. <laughs> it's amazing to see that in spite of all of this, I mean, if you go back to verse 20, it says, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. That's because God continued to use those that love him. And church, he will continue to use those that love him. Our, our new life, our peace, our courage, our care, it's all found in Him. So I want to ask you today, all of those things are found in Him. My question for you is if you're sitting here today, is yours? Is your peace, your courage, your care, is your love found in Him? If you've never come to an understanding of those things in your life, if you've never come to that love of Jesus in your life, if you've never surrendered your heart to Him, what's holding you back? I mean, we're going to sing a song here in a minute entitled, Jesus Paid It All. Woo! Huh. Did he ever? The opening line, I hear the Savior say, thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me Thine all in all, everything that we could ever ask for or imagine is in Christ. So what's stopping you? I pray in the name of Jesus that if you've never accepted him as your Lord and Savior, that today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. If God is working on your heart, if he's tugging on you, Man, don't put him off. We want to pray with you. We want to pray over you. Man, we'll, we'll come to you. <laughs> we'll come pray with you where you are. Let's turn this stage into an altar. But as we stand and as we sing, let's do business with God, church. Let's stand together. Your say, thy 
Yeah.